few years back, a story popped up on CNN that I don't know how many people even recognized it or saw it, and I don't know how much it was remembered, but I wrote it down. It said, the story said, astronomers have found at least seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the same star 40 light years away, according to a study published in the journal Nature. The findings were also announced at a news conference at NASA headquarters in Washington. This discovery outside of our solar system is rare because the planets have the winning combination of being similar in size to Earth and being all temperate, meaning they could have water on their surfaces and potentially support life. Now, if you think one day we might travel to one of those planets, <laughs> unlikely. 40 light years in distance under current space travel limitations, it would take us a million years to get there. But NASA now has telescopes through which we can see that far in the distance. And that far is not anywhere near the end of a universe that is greater than our minds can possibly conceive. Gives a whole new meaning to the words, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, what do we wonder? How great thou art. We live in times when many things, once unexplainable, can now be explained. We know more about the human body and how it works and what to do when it does not work than ever before. I think back, not that far, to the decade of my youth, the 70s. Anybody shout out the 70s? Amen. Amen. Both of my grandfathers died in that decade. Both of them in their mid-60s, near my age. Both of heart disease that led to life-ending heart attacks. Today, their heart disease would have been treated with medications and stents and maybe even open-heart surgery. It was not done back then because we could not explain the things about how the heart functions and how to fix it when it doesn't function as we can today. With the advent of the internet, our access to information and our opportunities to gain knowledge and to find answers to our, our questions and our ability to explain things is far greater than at than at any time in human history. You want to know the square root of 625,437? Pull out your smartphone. <laughs> in about three seconds, you push a few buttons, and you got it. Yeah. Want to know what the weather's going to be tomorrow in Sydney, Australia? Or where to get the best pizza in Chicago? Or how to play the harmonica? Or why ants live in colonies? Ask theory, right? <laughs> Go to the internet. It yes. will all be answered yes. and explained. You have a whole library right here. Mm -hmm. Right now. It has been said that knowledge is power, and indeed knowledge that helps us understand and explain things in life can and does bring us comfort. But there's a dark side to our gaining knowledge. There can be a sense that with knowledge we've gained control. And with control we've conquered or eliminated the unexplained. We have forgotten in our times 
how to live in the midst of the unexplained, the mystery of life. In our story today, Jesus has invited Peter and James and John to climb up the mountain with him. And once they get to the top, something happens which came as total surprise to Peter, James, and John. As Nancy just read from the message, there Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, long dead, talking with Jesus. It happened. All four gospel writers record this incident. And in the book of 2 Peter, the story is retold again. It happened. Jesus lit up, for lack of a better description, and with him, Moses and Elijah, centuries gone, giants in the faith of the Israelites, representatives of the law and the prophets, are right there with Jesus. What in the is going on? Who can possibly explain it? <coughs> Have you ever had an experience you cannot explain? Before you know it, you're caught off guard. There's a lump in your throat, tears in your eyes, goosebumps on your arms, a warmth in your heart, trouble catching your breath. Not a bad experience, just an unexplainable <coughs> experience. There are experience, th these sort of experiences, the kind of experiences which are difficult to put to words and sometimes to try and describe them only diminishes them. It happens. It happens in places like the birthing room. Whether a new baby is planned or not, what parent ever feels totally prepared for the arrival? Huh? There's always questions. Can we do this parenting thing? Will we have enough money? Will we, be adequately, will we be able to adequately provide for this child? Will we know what to do when they cry as an infant or talk back as teenagers? You know, if folks waited to have children until they felt 100% prepared for parenthood, the human race would likely go extinct. More often than not, the pregnancy sometimes comes unplanned and there's lots of insecurities and unanswered questions and doubts and fears. And yet, when that first cry is heard and that bundle of new life is held, transformative. A moment which touches deep in the heart cannot be explained. Have you ever been smitten? <laughs> They're too young. <laughs> I love to hear stories about how couples come together. And many of you have a story, I'm sure, to tell. Very few of us have stories that start with, well, it was a perfect match from the beginning. You know, the high school homecoming queen marrying the captain of the football team. No, not for most of us. That's not our story. <laughs> it was more like, can you believe we ever came together? <laughs> Here I was, 27 years old, <laughs> and Jean was not 27. <laughs> I had never been married, not even dated that much. She had previous marital experience on her resume, <laughs> along with two sons, a seven-year-old and a 13-year-old. My job at the time was as a chaplain intern making $12,000 a year. She asked me early on in our relationship, she said, you're a preacher. Are you sure you don't need some young virgin? <laughs> I think she thought she'd read that in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> Did not make sense. I think both of our families had that sort of reaction to the news of our relationship. Could not be explained. But it was right. 
Have you ever found yourself doing something you never dreamed you'd be doing or imagined you would do? From a website entitled Meant to be Happy comes this story. As an infant, he was largely abandoned to a nanny. His mother, in fact, rarely saw him. His dad almost never did. At seven years old, he was sent to a boarding school where he proved to be literally the worst in his class. His, his parents got reports that declared their son seems, quote, unable to learn anything. He was punished severely, once being dragged into a room and beaten until bloody for school infractions. He changed schools after his nanny discovered welts on his back from the beatings once he was home on a break. He made no friends at school. His mom rarely visited him and even forgot to send him Christmas presents. His dad also failed to visit him at school ever, even when he was nearby and his son wrote letters asking him to stop by. His letters were never even answered. Dear dad didn't even know exactly how old his own son was. Later, as a teen, his father wouldn't let him go to the best school, saying that his son would just embarrass him, that he was, quote, such a stupid boy. He just couldn't accept that kind of public humiliation from, quote, that damned impotent little idiot. Again, in high school, he did not fare too well, as if to underscore that fact, on parent visitation days, while other kids' parents came to see their children, his never did. Mm -hmm. The class would march out in rank order from the highest score to the lowest. He was always dead last. His parents were embarrassed, so they stayed home. He felt the sting of it, as he said sharply, certainly a gross understatement. When he proudly wrote his dad telling him he had been accepted into military college, his dad finally wrote back to say, you're a constant disappointment to me. Not only are you a complete failure, I see nothing ahead for you in the future. Do not write me anymore. I do not wish to hear anything more from you. The same year the son graduated from military college, his dad died in lingering pain and agony after being brought home in a straitjacket. So who is this failure of a son? <clears throat> who was it that went nowhere and did nothing? Who was it that was hampered by a loveless childhood with a detached mother and a verbally and emotionally abusive father who never understood or cared for his own son? Who was this hapless son from an unhappy family? He was an artist, winning several awards under a pseudonym. He was a very successful author of several books, one winning him a Nobel Prize, making him a wealthy man. He was the lone voice who saw war coming in the appeasement policies of Neville Chamberlain that brokered with Germany. He was made Prime Minister of England twice and presided over a successful war against the spread of Nazism. His name, Sir Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. cannot be explained. A life transformed. Wow. Some of you have heard the story of this place. This place. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have not. When we first began talking about the possibility of doing ministry here in this spot, all we had was a building. A building that had been beautifully cared for by the members of the Orville United Methodist Church over their 112 years. But about a year after the Orville Church was closed, word got out on the streets that the building was sitting empty. And just weeks after we began discussion about the possibility of what wasn't even yet named South Main, the building was broken into and vandalized. And over the next few months, at least seven more break-ins occurred. Windows broken out, doors damaged, 
heating and air units inside and out stolen, all the electrical work stripped out, plumbing gone. We got the estimate for fixing all of that, just over $100,000. Would that kill the project? The United Methodist Church in South Carolina, what we call the conference, owned the building. You're going to be, if you haven't already, you're probably hearing, be hearing a few things about the United Methodist Church over the next few months. <laughs> Listen to what I have to say about it. The United Methodist Church in South Carolina, called the conference, owned our building. The trustees of the conference who make decisions about properties owned by the conference, there are a group of people from all over the state of South Carolina I don't know how many of them there are, probably 10 or 12 or so. I doubt any of them had ever seen this building. The insurance company that the conference had insurance with on this property would not cover the damage because the building was considered empty and abandoned. On a Sunday afternoon in February of 2014, nine years ago exactly, the attorney who represents the conference in all legal matters was going to be in Anderson for another reason, but asked to see this building. Our district superintendent brought her here. When I met them both out there in the parking lot, which was pretty much just a dirt field at that point, when I met them both and introduced myself to the attorney, she said, the trustees of the conference met on Friday for two and a half hours about what to do with this building. I thought, here it comes. She's going to tell me they've decided to sell it. To get it off their hands. Our dream is over. She said at the end of that meeting, they voted to spend $90,000 of conference money to fix the building so that a new church could start here. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Before I knew what I was doing, I had this woman in a hug, and tears <laughs> were in my eyes, and there was a lump in my throat. Oh. I could not explain why they had made this decision. But I knew then what I know now without a doubt. God has got this thing. Amen. The story from the mountaintop today confirms what Jesus was and is and what he's about. Letting the world know God has got it. <laughs> we don't have to necessarily completely understand or know how to explain it to experience what it means to be loved by God. A voice was heard on the mountaintop that day which said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In these times when there are so many competing voices, and there are so many hard and fast opinions, and there are so many wide-reaching interpretations of what God is all about and wants for us and from us, let's turn back and listen to Jesus. Jesus said, when I was hungry, and when I was thirsty, and when I was in prison, and when I was sick, you were there for me. Yes, Lord. Or, you were not there for me. And that's, what's ma and that's what matters in the long run. <clears throat> Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus said, turn the other cheek and give to the one who's taking your shirt, your coat also. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weighed down my life. And I will give you rest. Yeah. You know, some things just cannot be explained. They can only be experienced. As the gift, such as the gift God has given to me and to you 
in his love, which can never be taken away. And in his promise that he has a place for all of us in eternity. God has got this. He has got this. Let's pray. From the mountaintops of our own lives, we hear the words, you are my beloved. You are loved. We can't explain why we're loved. Lord knows. You know, Lord. It isn't something we've earned or necessarily deserved. It's just something that you've promised. That you love. And that you have got us in the palm of your hand. And so today, whatever we're carrying around with us, whatever fear or whatever guilt or whatever worry or whatever anger or bitterness or whatever we're having, we have in us that is simply weighing us down like a ton of bricks inside of us, as has been sung to us today. Help us, Lord, today to lay it all down. Yes, Lord. Here it's your own. Yes, Lord. And have your own way in our lives. Yes, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.